Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to live on YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about the top eight basic home design flaws. We're going to get it in, get into it pretty quickly here, guys. Um, I'm going to try and post the link, and hopefully it works this time. If you want to follow along, you can head over to our website. This is a video based on a blog I wrote a while ago, so you can try and see if it'll come up for you uh, there. Um, that's actually a list opt-in that you can go to if you'd like to. And you can download this blog in our blog book. Um, if you'd rather just follow along with it on our website, you can try this link here as well. Uh, and it will take you hopefully to, let's see if it works. I'll just try it on my side here. Yep, it worked for me. So hopefully it works for you as well. We're going to be talking about the top eight things that I see people get wrong in their homes. And from there, uh, hopefully it'll give you guys some insights with regards to how to make corrections in your own systems, whether you're designing a house or planning a retrofit. I'm just gonna adjust my camera just a little bit here, guys. Um, if you're just getting into the show, just make sure you sign in and uh, let us know where you're coming from, as well as uh, what your name is. That'd be great. You can just introduce yourself. Interest, excuse me, I can't speak today. Uh, introduce yourself to the folks in the chat room. That'd be great. Um, and we're going to get into it here right away. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, then we'll start talking about these flaws. All right, so you should be seeing the top eight basic home design flaws. This is in our blog book, which you can get a copy of if you choose to. Um, it's the first link that I've posted up there on the chat window. Uh, it looks like this. And what we did is we put together all of our top blogs into one place uh, so that you guys can read them. And we laid it out in a nice magazine style format so it's easy to read. And so we're going to be scrolling down to the top eight home design flaws that we see. And then we'll try and go through this uh, in relatively short order. I'll, I'll make sure I cover everything, but uh, feel free to ask any questions at the end. Um, if you guys can, can write them down um, as we're going through them and then post them up towards the end, that'd be great. Then we can make sure we don't miss any of them in the, the chat window there. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Hey, little brother, um, too shy to come say hello at Cabin Fever. Oh, well, no worries, maybe you can, you can come next time. That'd be great. Um, and Valley View Farm, Deborah from Eastern Capel Valley. Uh, your second link doesn't work for me. Hmm, not sure why. Uh, you can download the blog book from the first link um, the second link did work for me. I'll just try it one more time and see if I can get it to go. Nope, it's still 404. I am not sure why we're getting those issues. Um, let me try one more time here just before we get into this. Yeah. It seems as though there's an extra... Uh, character being put on to the, I'm not sure if that's YouTube that's doing that or not, but it's causing some sort of an issue there with the redirect. So neither works for you. Okay, try that link there, guys. See if that works. I, I tried to change what's coming up on the back there. I think there's an extra character somehow going in there. That one works for me now. And I'll try this one too. Nope, none of them. Okay, that's great to know. I will continue to work on why our website is not coming up when I put links into the window here. So thanks again for being patient with me on all that stuff, guys. Um, anyways, I will get into the blog here and you'll find this available in the show notes below at the end of this video. Um, okay, so over the last 10 years, I've seen a ton of mistakes in home design in both urban and rural properties. And so 
what I did was I put together a bunch of blog posts uh, that kind of detailed out some of these issues because I thought that it would be worth having a conversation about them um, on the website, basically, uh, and hoping that people would pay attention to them and, and start to acknowledge some of these things in the way that we were currently designing, retrofitting and building houses. So the first one's pretty obvious. Um, it's amazing how large uh, people are building houses. And there's two things here. Number one is people are building big houses, but number two, the, um, the big issue that I see here, and it's interesting, I was at um, a cross country ski lessons with my son the other day, and I was talking to one of the fathers there who's a geologist. And it, there's kind of two camps with regards to where we sit globally right now from a peak gas, peak oil perspective. And some people, <clears throat> And, and it's not just people like me, it's like geologists kind of sit in two camps and engineers sit in two camps. Um, some people believe that there's an endless amount of natural gas and oil in the world, um, or at least, um, you know, another hundred years of the stuff. And for me, the time frame is kind of irrelevant because, you know, I've got little kids, they're going to, you know, be amongst, um, the decline when it occurs, it's definitely going to happen in the next hundred years for sure. And probably sooner than that. Um, but there are two camps basically. And there are some people that think that it's going to happen very quickly or that it's already happened. And then there's some people who kind of buy into this whole um, shale gas, shale oil uh, story and say that, um, you know, it's never going to end. And, there's this interesting thing about oil and gas, um, specifically all of the shale oil and gas, is that they have production patterns that follow what's called a hyperbolic curve, especially gas. And which means that the gas comes on really, really quick, and then it falls off really fast on the back end. And um, because of this, the it gives you it gives a false sense of security with regards to how much gas because of the rate that it comes on um, but it's easy to overlook how fast it falls off on the other side and in order to compensate for that quick fall off on the other side um, they end up having to drill lots and lots of wells they have to invest lots of money and you end up having all this fracking going on and we can this, today's talk is not about fracking so we don't need to get into the politics of fracking right now um, but in addition to all of that, um, with these fast decline curves. And um, there's, this, there's this other kind of concept within the world of natural gas, which is the amount of energy that we have to invest into these systems in order to get energy out. And so over the years, the energy returned on energy invested has been declining. Um, and then to compound all of that, because natural gas is pretty much free right now, I mean, it's like $3 a gigajoule. Um, natural gas companies aren't really natural gas companies anymore. They're um, going after the light ends, which is the, the hydrocarbons that they use to create diluent for, which is for, for diluting the oil sands. Now, you're probably wondering where I'm going with all of this in terms of a house being too big, but basically where I'm going with this is that natural gas right now is a waste product. And essentially homes, inefficient homes are disposal units. And so inefficient homes are beneficial to the overall mechanism right now, because really the thing that they're going after are the light ends, which um, get produced at a fraction of, the, of a percentage of the natural gas. And so it's in the best interest um, for there to be a place to send all this natural gas. Now, in addition to all of that, natural gas is really hard to store because it's a gaseous product. So housing stock takes a really long time to to transition. It's not like vehicles. It's not like one or two decades. It can take, you know, 30, 40, 50 years to transition an entire housing stock. And if we run out of natural gas in the next 50 years, especially in the colder parts of Canada and the United States, there could be significant areas where homes are no longer able to heat themselves because they've built themselves around this infrastructure of cheap and basically free and abundant natural gas. And when you think about, there's two numbers that I like to talk about in our permaculture design courses. One is um, 1200 and one is 21. 1200 is approximately the temperature that natural gas uh, burns at um, when you're running a furnace. 
And 21 is the temperature that we tend to keep our houses at. So you know, to translate that over into uh, US customary units at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So heating our houses with natural gas is like cutting butter with a chainsaw. And if we end up in a situation where we don't have enough natural gas to keep houses warm, um, there is going to be a massive catastrophe. So I think one of the things that you can do to kind of mitigate this risk or this black swan is to live in smaller houses. And then if you live in a smaller house, you can invest more money per square foot into making the house more energy efficient. I think all of our houses could be up to 90% more energy efficient than they are today. And if you are watching the whole natural gas uh, kerfuffle going on right now, um, I think that this is something worth being a little bit concerned about. I don't think you should not sleep at night as a result of it, um, but we are completely complacent with regards to where our thermal energy is gonna come from. And if you live in a place like I do, it's minus 20 outside right now in Calgary, um, we cannot live in this ecosystem easily without $3 natural gas. I, I mean, even at $15 natural gas, um, that's gonna be challenging for a lot of people to, to, to pay for. So we need to live in smaller houses. We need those smaller houses to be better insulated. Um, and we need to think that about natural gas as not being an infinite resource, which is the way we currently treat it right now. Hopefully that made a bit of sense. We can talk more about that at the end if you'd like. Um, home design flaw number two, building for a view. Now, this is a, a common thing that I see uh, over and over and over again. People that buy these crazy properties, these big, big properties. The properties are actually fine themselves, um, but a lot of times the purchase itself was made because of a specific view that they were going after. And they end up putting their house in the location that has the best view. Now, um, view is an interesting thing because when you first build a house for view, that's all you notice. All you notice is the view. But as you live in that house longer, the view becomes less important. You kind of adapt to it. You, it becomes, you become complacent towards the view. And um, maybe some people don't, but a lot of people do. The problem with the properties that have the best views or the house locations that have the best view is that that location is a location that you're gonna inevitably be paying for for the, the remainder of the ownership of that house. So these are generally the most wind exposed. And so by sheltering a house from wind, you can reduce its energy consumption by up to 50%. Um, and so if, you're, if you've got a great view, but it's exposed to wind, you're potentially using 50% more energy to keep that house warm than you would be if you had it in a sheltered location. Um, it's also typically more prone to disaster as well, um, because again, it's more exposed. And a lot of times it's really expensive to get to that location. So we end up having to have larger and longer roads, which means more maintenance in the winter time. And again, more energy. And in a low energy future, these types of situations are not really gonna be all of that um, desirable, essentially. So, Building in a place that has less of a view is generally gonna give you better food productivity. It's going to um, allow you to live in a house that consumes less energy. Um, it's gonna give you a little bit more privacy and it's gonna be less prone to disasters. Um, generally speaking as well, um, it, it usually means that we end up being lower on the slopes, which means that we can get access to uh, gravity fed water, um, we have microclimates that we can work with. So there's all sorts of benefits. Don't always go straight to the view when you're looking at building a house. It can make a really big difference in, in the interim, but also many, many years down the road. Home design flaw number three, basements and sump pumps. And so if you've been following along on the introduction to permaculture series that we've been running, um, we talk about this concept of water access and structures. And so we see a lot of houses that get placed in incorrect locations and then they compensate for those mistakes by putting in a sump pump. Now, sump pumps um, are kind of my nemesis for lots of reasons. Number one, it's a, it's a mechanical uh, device and so it'll eventually break. So if your house depends on the, a functioning sump pump, and all of a sudden the power goes out or the pump breaks, which it has done several times for me uh, at one of the houses that, um, that my mother-in-law has, uh, or her vacation home. Um, luckily we've been there when that sump pump has stopped operating. 
Uh, but there have been several sleepless nights that I've had to endure in order to make sure that the basement doesn't flood. So number one, it's a mechanical part, so it breaks. Number two, it's dependent on an electrical system, which is pretty antiquated and old in North America. Um, this, the, the gas grid, I would say, is actually more resilient than the electrical grid. And it, it's probably going to get less resilient in the next in the coming years as we transition over to renewables and some of these massive base loads, uh, base load power plants like coal plants and natural gas plants come offline, um, nuclear potentially, depending on where you live. And so the grid could actually become a little bit less stable. And so if your house depends on real time available energy to run a sump pump all the time, then um, then you could be in trouble um, and you could end up having a flooded basement which can cause mold or the, the complete replacement of the basement and then in addition to that a lot of our clients want to go off grid or have the ability to have renewable energy systems but if you just go and spend 30 grand on a renewable energy system and you end up um, you know 10 or 15 percent of your investment in collecting energy is going straight into a sump pump to make sure that the basement doesn't flood it seems like a bit of a waste of that renewable energy system i mean that energy could be put to such better use than just trying to dewater the groundwater which you'll never succeed at you'll never beat the groundwater it'll just constantly come so in permaculture we call this a type one error um, and so if you can if you're buying a new house if you're going to be building a new house um, consider slab on grade and if you are going to do a basement then look for a place where you can do a walkout or ensure that the groundwater table is not that high so that when you place this concrete boat into the water that you're not having to run a pump all the time in order to uh, prevent the, the basement from imploding on itself basically. Home design flaw number four, poor rainwater management. Uh, this is something like if this is the only tip that you get out of today, it'll have been worth the time that you spent um, watching this program live on YouTube. Um, it's amazing how often people just place their downspouts right next to their foundation. And um, the water just pours down. Like, you know, it, it's unbelievable. And so, <coughs> excuse me, there's really two things that you can do. You can either harvest that water into a rain tank and then manage the overflow appropriately, or you can extend your downspouts uh, far away from your foundation, at least 10 feet is the recommended amount, more is better sometimes. And then once the downspout is away from the foundation, then use that water, put it to productive use. Um, but it's unbelievable. I, I go to houses with sump pumps and the owner says, well, the sump pump never shuts off. And then you walk around the house and the downspouts are pouring right into the foundation. So almost every house that I go to has this problem. Um, and so this is not what I went into permaculture to teach about, but um, when we're talking about maintaining our um, tangible assets like houses, this is such a simple thing that you can do to prevent yourself any, having a, a massive failure, uh, either a sump pump failure, or what can happen is the water will actually accumulate around the basement and it creates hydraulic pressure. And that hydraulic pressure can get strong enough that it'll actually push the concrete in um, and crack it. So you can actually damage your foundation. Home design, design flaw number five, complicated shapes. So this is becoming um, almost comical now. There's a lot of uh, emphasis going into the design of houses to make them look unique and different. And I get it. It's kind of like the same thing, the same reason that we buy new cars all the time and we buy new clothing is we're always looking for, um, we're always looking for, uh, you know, something new and unique to differentiate ourselves from our neighbor. And, um, and so one of the things that, um, especially in cold climates that can really enhance the heat loss effect of your specific house is the installation of these overhangs or cantilevers. Um, my house actually has a couple of them and it's an attempt to try and create surfaces and different shapes so that your house looks a little bit more interesting. So I get that aesthetics are important, but they come at the expense of 
thermal comfort. And so down the road, when you don't really get too concerned about how your house looks and you're looking at it from the outside and you don't notice all those different surfaces and things like that, you will notice the thermal comfort loss by having all of these um, cantilevered um, shapes coming out of your house that are losing tons and tons of energy. So it's important to kind of put your ego to the side when you're looking to buy a new house or build a new house and try and think about the factors that are going to be important to you in 5, 10, 15 years down the road when the aesthetic has kind of become passe. And, um, and so once that does happen, at least if you've got a house that is not, you know, chic or brand new uh, looking or unique in the current time, at least you'll have a building that's really warm inside. And that, you know, time and time again, those are the things that people are going to notice is how warm your house feels compared to others. It's amazing how many homes I go into that never feel warm. They always feel cold. And so if you're looking to buy a new house, look for houses that have simple shapes that don't have a lot of cantilevers and exposed floor area um, because those houses are always going to be cold. And, you know, the other interesting thing is that we've got this trend where we buy houses in the springtime when it's not really all that cold outside anymore. And so we don't really get to feel what that house is like in the wintertime. I think buying a house in the dead of winter is a great thing um, to do, it, you know, in terms of uh, making sure that the house is actually going to perform. There's all sorts of other things that you can do as a result of, um, you know, looking at a house in the wintertime, there's thermal imaging cameras, you can get them for smartphones now. And so what a great way to look at where the house is leaky by looking at it through an infrared camera. Um, so maybe consider um, looking at your house from a winter perspective, as opposed to a spring and a summer perspective as well. Home design flaw number six, the wrong solar orientation. So I've said this over and over and over again. Um, if engineers and architects knew our south was, we could save 50% of the energy that our houses and buildings use. Um, literally just orienting the longer side of your house to the south um, will reduce the energy consumption of that building and increase the thermal comfort by up to 50%. Now, this is partially uh, an engineer and architect issue, but it's also um, an urban planning issue. And so a lot of our cities, especially Calgary, is really bad for this. The houses end up being oriented 100% in the wrong way. So they're north-south as opposed to east-west. And the people that buy these houses have to deal with this poor planning decision um, for forevermore. I mean, we're not going to change the streets and, and, and all this stuff. And so there's, there's a lot of things that you can't do to fix that problem. That's another type one error. So again, if you're looking for a new house or you're buying a, a house that's used, try and find a house that has a proper Southern orientation. And again, it'll feel warmer inside of it. You'll use dramatically less energy. It's far more retrofitable, which means that if you do re-insulate it and put proper windows in, you're going to end up um, having a building that will stay warmer and use less energy forevermore. Um, I, when, when we get asked to look at houses, that's one of the first things that we look at is orientation. In addition to that, if, if it's properly oriented and depending on the slopes of the roofs and things like that, um, you know, when we were in, in Sydney, Australia, almost 10 years ago, uh, there, were, there was an urban planning professor that I went to go and see to learn some GIS skills from. And he told me that the cities in the, like the large global cities were already mapping out the cities to determine what the solar resources were on all the roofs within their cities using satellite telemetry and imagery. field. I mean, it's basically an energy generation system waiting to happen. And if you buy a house that has an improperly oriented roof or the roof is shaded, um, that's an inferior house. That's a house you do not want to own in the next 50 years. People are going to start buying houses based on its ability to collect solar thermal and solar electrical energy. We have not avoided peak oil. We have not avoided peak gas and we've not avoided peak coal we are coming up against hard energy limits as a society. And if you start doing the numbers, 
you can very quickly see that it, it doesn't actually matter if it happens in 5, 10, 15, or 100 years. It matters to you and me, but at some point, it's going to create a complete shift in the way that society operates. Buildings that are oriented properly are going to be worth dramatically more money than buildings that are not oriented properly because um, natural gas or these high energy fuels are not going to be available. And it's these high energy fuels that allows us to make silly decisions about how we orient houses, what types of cars we buy, what, um, how big of a house we build. There's just no feedback. There's no consequence for making bad decisions because energy is basically free. So wrong solar orientation is something that you really need to think about if you're, if you're looking for a new house. Home design flaw number seven, under insulated homes. Now this is pretty much every house that I go and visit in Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, um, any place in a cold climate, houses are under insulated. To give you an idea of what properly insulated houses mean in this climate, um, we need walls that are like R50, R60, um, ish and like the average 1970s bungalow in Calgary, we're talking about R8. Okay, so you know almost a factor of eight or nine uh, less insulation than it should have. So that's a really big deal. And then roof insulation should be upwards of you know R80, R90 um, to get that energy load down sufficient enough so that we can actually mostly heat our house with solar energy with a little bit of ancillary heat if needed. And then if, if we have no ancillary heat, at least we know our house is not going to go below zero. And then when we go below grade, we should have R20, R30 in the ground to keep the heat in our basements and at the very least in our slabs if we go slab on grade. So we've basically designed houses in these cold climates that have almost the same amount of insulation as houses in California. It's completely insane. So because every house is under insulated, the solution to that is to make sure that if you do end up buying a house that's properly oriented, that you make sure that the house has the right characteristics um, that it can be re-insulated uh, and retrofitted into the future to reduce that uh, thermal energy load on the house. And there's certain characteristics, like for example, um, one of the things I always look for are eaves, making sure that the eave is uh, large enough so that we can add additional thickness into the walls without compromising the rain screen on the outside of the house. Um, or looking on the perimeter of the house to make sure that we can actually go below grade and add additional insulation below the slab. So there's lots of things like that that you can look at to determine whether the house is actually retrofittable. Um, and one of the main reasons for retrofitting, again, is adding additional insulation. Um, one of the lowest lying fruits when it comes to insulation is windows. And generally a house will lose 50 to 80% of its energy just through poorly designed or installed windows. Um, so there's amazing wind window technology coming out right now. It can completely change the thermal dynamics of your house. Um, so I uh, recommend checking that out. And again, you're gonna get a lot more out of those windows if the house is oriented properly. Home design flaw number eight poor tree selection and placement. So this is another thing that just blows me away driving through the cities. There must have been some crazy initiative back in the 1970s and 80s just to place blue spruce trees everywhere in the city. Blue spruces are really beautiful. They're really nice trees, but um, they're not a city tree. It's not a tree that you should have in the city. We should have deciduous trees and trees that are to the south should be especially deciduous. So they let sun in the winter and they block it in the summertime. Um, but we should have actually thought about where these trees got placed. If we were insistent on putting in spruce trees, we should have been a little bit more selective about where they, they ended up going in. It's unbelievable how many properties I drive by, you know, looking at blue spruce trees that should be, should be taken down. Either they're dropping massive amounts of needles onto the roof, which makes rainwater harvesting more challenging, or they're blocking out all the sun on the property or on the house. Um, and so there's just, there was no thought that went in to where blue spruces and, and just trees in general in the city got placed. Um, and so we really need to bring more of a design element in so that instead of just saying, well, when you build a house, you have to put this size of tree and uh, you know, number of trees onto the property. There's one more stipulation that we actually need to take 
a few more things into account. For example, access to solar energy, the types of trees that you're going to grow. I mean, imagine if every tree in the city had to have some sort of edible or medicinal function to it. Now, most plants do have medicinal functions. Not all of them have edible functions, um, but it would require a little bit more design. And I feel as though a lot of that, those opportunities got missed. And now we're kind of going back and looking at it and say, well, if we take solar energy, we take insulation, retrofitability, um, um, you know, access to renewable energy into account, we would have a completely different design of city than we have right now. And um, they're really, really simple things, um, but you need to kind of think about those things on the front end. So if you're lucky enough to be looking for a house right now, hopefully these eight ideas will play a role into how you um, look for a house. Um, and, um, and if you have any questions about any of this stuff, by all means, put it up into the, into the chat window there, guys. And I'm happy to answer anything, um, that, any questions that you guys have regarding house design or house placement. <laughs> um, uh, I see this as an incredible opportunity. I see it as an incredible opportunity for homeowners. I see it as an incredible opportunity for people that want to consult on this stuff. Um, the, I, I, I don't think we can wait another 10 or 15 years to start retrofitting our houses. You know, I mean, even though the housing stock takes 20, 30, 40 years to um, refresh, we actually have to start um, thinking about retrofitting right now. And I don't know how quick it's going to happen, but um, if you're conscientious and, and conscience, conscious of these facts and these ideas, I encourage you to go check them out on your own. Um, there's a couple of great re resources out there. Resilience.org is a great website if you're interested in peak oil and peak gas and where that whole conversation is going. Um, and it'll give you some ideas with regards to how quickly and how severe it might be. But um, imagine a situation where all the natural gas gets shut off when there's no more natural gas. Like what's going to happen? How are we going to coexist in this cold northern climate um, without free and abundant cheap natural gas? And I want to I put one more thing out there if all of us started burning wood to heat our houses without retrofitting the houses first, there'd be no trees left on this earth in five to 10 years. Um, and so that's a, another thing that terrifies me. Um, we will end up wholesale burning the whole planet in order to keep ourselves these, these monstrosities warm. So we really do need to um, first look at dealing with the energy consumption issue first and then moving to replacing energy and that's really just part of good design okay lots of good questions coming in hey guys if you've uh, got some some value out of this i'd love it if you hit the uh, the like button if you're not subscribed to the channel make sure you subscribe and i'm going to start answering some questions here seek to find question how do you feel about houses embedded in hills or underground yeah, I think it can work really well. I think there's a few things you need to consider before you just go and put a house underground or embed it into a hill. Number one, um, radon is a big issue and it's becoming a bigger issue. It's the number two and maybe even number one leading issue now um, with lung cancer. So radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas and it is super hard to determine whether or not you have it on your property or you don't. I mean, it's not, it's, easy to determine. There's very, very simple radon detectors, and I can show you one if you guys are interested. Um, but you need to make sure you don't have a radon issue. That's number one. Number two is you need to understand your groundwater levels. And so if you have high groundwater levels, then building underground could be really problematic. Um, and, and that might not just be groundwater levels today. Groundwater levels do fluctuate. They go up and down. And so you need to talk to some locals and ask them what typically happens with groundwater issues. Um, and then it can can cost a lot more to build that way. So it's not that underground houses are bad or that you shouldn't do them. It's that you need to consider design um, in terms of um, how to best deploy a technology like that. Little brother, you said recently that the south side tree on your property can be advantageous in Southern Alberta to slow spring melt. Should this be an evergreen or deciduous? Can you expand on, on, on the thought? Yeah, yeah, totally. I just put a video up today on that. So there can be advantageous uh, shading go that goes on. Now that's advantageous for my food forest, but it's not advantageous for my neighbor or even for solar gain on my house. So it does come at the expense of some other things. 
Um, and if I did have the opportunity of, um, you know, replacing it with something, I probably would put a deciduous tree in there um, as opposed to a coniferous one, specifically because I'd still probably get some delay happening, especially if it was something like um, a poplar, which is one of the first trees to, to leaf out here. Uh, but then through the winter time, I'd have all the sun coming through the branches, um, which would allow it to, uh, you know, my house to, to have more solar energy on the roof. And if I ever do put a photovoltaic uh, array up onto the roof, then that would be very beneficial. So we have to consider our sectors, which is the word that we use to, um, to talk about energy and permaculture really carefully to understand what the pros and the cons are um, of any element that we place. And so it does benefit by slowing down the food forest, but I pay the price in additional sun energy in the late and uh, the, the early spring and the um, early uh, fall. Um, it, I do pay for that. Nick B, can adding insulation cause water vapor issues within walls? Absolutely, Nick. So there's a whole division of um, um, the construction industry now called building science. And when you start adding additional insulation onto buildings, you need to consider building science in the way that you construct. And so what Nick's getting at is that if you start putting vapor impermeable stuff on the outside of buildings, that you can end up trapping vapor in between your walls. And if that vapor condenses, because as it moves through the wall, it cools down, that condensation can actually create black mold and um, issues with uh, the integrity of your walls. And this has been popping up all over the place as people start moving towards more energy efficient buildings. And so if you have an old building and you plan on retrofitting it, you're likely going to have to get a building scientist engaged in order to help plan out how you're going to manage um, or how vapor is going to transit through the wall to make sure that you don't end up having an issue. Okay, little brother 82. Can you give any examples or links to the new window design technologies you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the companies in Canada that uh, is producing incredible windows is called OptiWin. Let me see if I can find their uh, their website. Yeah, OptiWin. Um, so I'll try and paste their URL into the window. And if you guys can just let me know if that works, that'd be great. Um, and if not, then I can uh, share my screen and show it to you. So these guys produce a triple glaze window. And one of the interesting things about windows is that uh, a lot of companies will talk about the R value of the window itself, the panes but they don't talk about the R value of the frame. And so you wanna make sure that the company that you buy your windows from is giving you a net number, a net R value from including the frame and the window itself. Uh, and then, uh, because if they don't, if, if they just talk about the window and not the frame, it can actually be quite a bit lower than what they're presenting to you. So OptiWin is one of the companies that I really like. Um, I've got several clients who have put them into their houses. They are more of a European style window. So they've got more of a European style uh, hinge and latch system, um, which means that they seal a lot better. So they're gonna have a lot less air infiltration, um, but they're also as high as like R8, R10, um, which is quite a bit higher than a lot of the standard North American windows. So I would check them out. The other window manufacturer that you can check out is Duxton Windows and they're Canadian. And I'll bring their website up here too. And these guys have a fairly good triple pane window. Um, they've got fiberglass frames, which is really nice. So fiberglass is, is a great frame material because it'll expand and contract at the same rate as glass because it's made out of glass. So um, it's worth checking them out. Um, so those would be two window manufacturers that I would uh, take a look at. Uh, next question, other, are, are there or other important permaculture passive house design considerations? Does Calgary city bylaw obstruct any of these choices? 
you know, it's funny. I was just talking about that last night. So I have a good friend, um, two good friends who built a passive house here in Calgary. And there's actually a company named Brookfield in Calgary, one of the largest builders in Calgary. Um, they also own a lot of the commercial buildings and they own a lot of residential buildings as well. And they are um, preventing a passive house. The city of Calgary is preventing a passive house from being uh, given occupancy because of some silly thing basically saying, Um, they can guarantee that it'll stay above 20 because all of the design calculations were at 20 degrees Celsius. And so there is resistance to this stuff. Um, I'm not sure why, and we could probably spend a whole hour just discussing uh, conspiracy theories and, and various other reasons that, uh, that these things are not being allowed. I think people just don't like change. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's sad that it takes so long to make change like this because it's so desperately needed. But... Uh, there are definitely some very strange hurdles that do do not allow um, these things to move forward. I mean, I will just speak on behalf of the inspectors and the city and the politicians and stuff. They're kind of damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So when they allow something progressive to happen and it backfires on them, they get fired usually or sued or, you know, they take a lot of liability with regards to this stuff. So from their perspective, they don't really have an incentive to encourage change uh, sometimes. And, um, and then on the other side, if they don't encourage change, then there's guys like us that go to them and say, well, you guys are holding back progress. So, you know, society takes a long time to move through these issues. And, um, you know, it's conversations like this on YouTube and <clears throat> the courses that we offer and other courses that get people thinking outside the box um, that really to help to facilitate that change um, because it changes the conversation that occurs, uh, you know, in our society, essentially. Little brother, I wonder if there's, uh, if it's practiced anywhere, a hybrid automatic mass heater that uses natural gas instead of having to feed it wood, like the advertised rocket mass heater. Does that concept make sense? So I have played around with our rocket mass heater in terms of um, uh, turning it into a pellet stove, and I've had quite a bit of success with it. Um, and so that's possible, but, um, one of the things that, uh, people get constantly confused about is this idea that thermal mass is going to solve all of our problems. Thermal mass is part of the problem. A lot of our buildings are lacking thermal mass, but it's not the entire problem. And so we really do need to look at, um, insulation and thermal mass together. And so in our ecosystem, the optimized house is going to have really, really well insulated walls and, um, fairly heavily massed on the inside to uh, reduce the um, effect of changing temperatures on the outside. So um, thermal mass is definitely one part of the solution, but it's not the entire solution. Okay. Walkout basements, are they only for homes built on slopes? Uh, yes and no. So sometimes uh, people will build walkout basements by piling up dirt on their property to make kind of an artificial hill. Um, and you don't actually need that much of a slope to have a walkout basement. But um, if you do need to have a basement, a walkout basement is a, is a far more sustainable option. Um, if you do have a, an exposed or daylit portion of your basement, it means that you can avoid the sump pump basically. So you can daylight all of the drainage pipes. So you don't have to have a pump running all the time. Um, so there are a lot of advantages to those types of buildings. Um, but uh, yeah, you usually do have to have a little bit of a slope unless you're gonna build your own slope. Valley View Farms, what do you think of adding extra thermal mass to south facing exposed foundation to help hold heat? So again, the thermal mass, like imagine like the most the biggest thermal mass buildings ever built were the castles in England. Um, they were horrible places to live. They were horrible because thermal mass is actually still a conductor. It holds heat, but it also conducts heat. So in order for thermal mass to be effective in this ecosystem, you have to find a way to get the heat into the building, which is our windows, our high efficiency windows. And ideally that radiation that comes through those windows is gonna hit a thermal mass that's gonna absorb that energy. And then we have to put insulation around the thermal mass to keep the energy inside the building. 
So that's the, the pattern of construction within this ecosystem that's really important. And um, if you just build buildings that have high thermal mass, like um, adobe houses or um, uh, you know concrete houses in this ecosystem, they'd be horrible, horrible places to live. You need to have that insulation on the outside. So if you want to add additional uh, thermal mass into the building, you're going to need to do it on the inside. And, and this is why having concrete floors or uh, gypcrete floors or cob floors are really advantageous because they will create a thermal mass substrate that the sun can hit and absorb into. Can an annualized geosolar heat collection system be added to an existing home? It actually can. Um, you can store heat around the foundation of your house. So if you have a non-insulated or a foundation that's not insulated on the outside, you can actually store energy around the outside of that foundation and then hold it in with insulation around the annualized geosolar system. A colleague of mine in Invermere actually built one uh, for another client of his where they uh, just wrapped the house with the same concept that you can see on annualized geosolar. If you guys don't know what annualized geosolar is, I've got a YouTube video uh, in my channel on where we put an annualized geosolar in, uh, system underneath the house where it harvests thermal energy from the attic. So as the attic air heats up, we extract that energy and push it underground. We heat up a lens of soil underneath the house and then that heat slowly dissipates into the house above it. So it absolutely can work that way. Um, it's just a slightly different design, if you will. Little brother, okay, if it works, remove the dot en. It's okay for, okay, interesting. Thanks for the, um, thanks for the insight there. Maybe I'll, I'll get you guys just to check one more URL for me and see if you can get it to work because I'm still trying to diagnose this and that would be really helpful. You guys can see if that works for me, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Jordan, uh, can you quickly touch on the importance of biome specific heating, passive solar with fuel hedge and sunny prairies, forest thinning and kootenays to reduce fuel load and provide wood heat? Absolutely. So thanks Jordan for signing in, man. Um, uh, nice to see you. I hope that uh, you guys are getting a bit of sun out there right now. So every biome has its own um, bioregional advantage. And this is one of the, I think biggest problems with permaculture and any kind of design system at all is that humans love technique. We love to be told how to do things. Um, it takes a lot more effort and energy for us to think about the principles behind how you do something or why you might do it. And so the way that we heat something in the prairies is going to be totally different than the way that we heat something in the Kootenays. So where Jordan's from, they have these long, long, dreary, dark winters where th there's no sunlight that comes into the valley that he lives in, but they're surrounded by solar energy in the form of uh, standing biomass, so trees. Uh, and so out there, building a passive solar house doesn't make a lot of sense because you're not going to collect any solar energy anyways. Out there, in fact, you're probably designing to try and let as much light into the house so that you're, you're not depressed through the winter. Um, and heat in that region is going to come through burning of biomass, which is a, actually a waste product or it's a problem out there because it creates fire risk. Whereas on the prairies, you know, it gets down to minus 30 here on a regular basis, but we have a winter that is full of sun. It's pretty much sunny here almost every day of the year. And so having high sun and cold means that passive solar design is going to make a ton of sense out here. Burning wood stoves on the prairies, unless you've got your own fuel hedge, your own system for growing that wood, um, it's just not going to make a ton of sense. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been trying to pioneer with some of our stuff is, um, you know, actually using septic effluent to grow trees and then sizing the house heating system in such a way that we're producing enough biomass as a result of the septic effluent that's growing those trees a little bit quicker to actually keep the house warm. So again, trying to create those, um, those feedback loops um, and designing, always looking to see what the bioregional um, uh, tactic or strategy is that works within your system. And that includes food production, heating, water harvesting, um, 
you know, everywhere you go, it's a little bit different. And so you have to go back to those base principles and understand why we're making specific decisions and then make sure that it actually makes sense for that particular bioregion to do it in a specific way. Hopefully that made sense. Emphasis on no blanket solutions, context, context, context. Absolutely, yeah, totally. Thanks, Jordan. Um, seek to find, do you know if the neighborhood community out in Okotoks and their annualized heated homes has been successful? Um, would you recommend it being copied? Yeah, totally. Uh, so I think it has been successful overall. I think that there were some interesting political issues that occurred with that community, um, which I'm not super comfortable talking about on YouTube, but um, there was a lot of merit to it. However, to do it all over again, I think that they would have been much better uh, to put all that extra money into that solar heating system and storage mechanism into the insulation, windows, the orientation of the community is fine, um, but just making the houses far more energy efficient. I believe they met R2000 standards, which is okay, but they could have, um, uh, you know, exceeded passive house just by putting more energy into or, or thought and emphasis into the insulation. So here's the thing, guys, when you're designing a house, would you rather invest in moving machines things that break down or an element that once it's placed into a wall will last for 30, 40, 50, 100 years? And the answer is pretty obvious. You should be investing into systems that don't have any moving parts. I mean, insulation is solid state. It doesn't get more um, sustainable than that. You know, when we're comparing it to, let's say, um, a heat pump or a furnace or something like that. Um, these are things that just constantly save you. And even though energy is really cheap right now, the argument that I use with a lot of people is, is always that thermal comfort thing. Um, people will quickly go to say that, you know, their insulation won't pay for itself. It's not going to have a return on investment. Well, your car will never have a return on investment either. Yet we justify spending 30, 40, $50,000 on vehicles on basically assets that will only ever depreciate. Um, and so somehow the economics argument for vehicles just kind of goes out the window. If we were all making economic decisions about our cars, we'd all be driving used vehicles. Um, and, uh, and, you know, putting that money somewhere else. But insulation will always save you and it'll make you feel more comfortable and it'll improve the, the quality of your house. So uh, my recommendation would have been to take that additional, I think it was 20 or $30 million they spent on that system. And I, I can't remember if it was like 40 or 50 houses, but if they'd put that 20 or $30 million into the 40 or 50 houses into increased insulation, um, they would have negated the, the need for that um, solar thermal heating system. So a lot of times we uh, make decisions with our egos and men are more prone to this than women. Um, and so if we take our egos out of the equation, the better solution is always to try and design machines out of the system. All right, guys, well, we're wrapping up on the hour there. Um, hopefully you found that interesting. If you did, please hit the like button down below. It really helps the channel to track. Um, and sharing the video is really effective as well. Um, it's how I get paid um, is when you guys hit that like button and hit that share button. It helps me to track my message a little bit further. Um, we have uh, upcoming permaculture design courses on our website. If you guys have ever considered taking a permaculture design course, um, I'd highly recommend checking out the, the website for that information. I know there's a couple of grads on this call right now that you could uh, ask questions of or future calls. Um, they're usually signing in as well. Um, permaculture is a very hopeful design oriented system that helps you to take care of energy, food, water, security, to build community. And uh, a whole bunch of our students have gone on to create their own uh, permaculture livelihoods. If you're finding these live sessions really interesting, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what's working for you, what's not working for you. Are there specific subjects that you'd like me to cover um, in future live sessions? Um, do you have a burning question that I have not answered that you're really hoping that I'm gonna answer in a future session? And if you're looking for some design advice, we have a consultancy uh, offer that we, um, that we work with. So uh, Adaptive Habitat is our consulting company and we design resilient homes, acreages and farms 
for people that are looking for all of the same stuff that they get out of a permaculture design course, um, but in a more tailored solution. So hopefully you guys found this interesting. I'll be live again on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, uh, running our Introduction to Permaculture course, which has been hugely successful. Um, and then Friday, we're having a very special conversation about uh, vegetarianism and permaculture and where that uh, the whole diet nexus and how that fits into the larger ecosystem and what we should and shouldn't be eating and how to actually judge whether our food is ethical or not ethical and whether it makes sense from an energy perspective. It's bound to be a very interesting conversation. And that's happening at Friday at 3 p.m. So thanks again so much, guys. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and uh, we'll see you on the next live session.